this last trial. That's that day that you're coming back. We hope we have a day when well, Jesus opened the gate. Same song that are written about miracles, about the miracle maker. He is a miracle maker. Yes. I don't have the music to it, so I've got to sing it without the music. But one of these days I'll get, when this COVID stuff gets over, I can get a CD with some music. He's a miracle maker. He's a miracle man. He came to this earth to teach God's plan. He was born of a virgin, and he had no sin. He's a miracle maker. He's a miracle man. He turned the water to wine, gave sight to the blind. He told the lame to walk. Told the mute to talk, he cleansed the leper skin, and forgave our sins. He's a miracle maker, he's a miracle man. He raised the dead to life several times. He cast the demons out to a herd of swine. He healed an issue of blood and a withered hand. He's a miracle maker. He's a miracle man. He's a miracle maker. He's a miracle man. He came to this earth to teach God's plan. He was born of a virgin. And he had no sin. He's a miracle maker. He's a miracle man. God sent his son to be a sacrifice. He put him on a cross where he gave his life. He paid a debt we owe for all our sins. He's a miracle maker, he's a miracle man. He conquered Satan, death and the grave. He was resurrected so we could be saved. So call on Jesus and take a stand for that miracle maker. For that miracle man, he's a miracle maker, he's a miracle man. He came to this earth to teach God's plan. He was born of a virgin and he had no sin. He's a miracle maker, he's a miracle man. Oh, yes, my Jesus is a miracle man. And how I love that miracle man. Amen. Amen.
testimony this morning. Oh, it's the Lord. <laughs> we sang that song about the family of God. Yes. And we can look around and see we have a small family of God here. But we are, uh, how should I say, the largest family probably in the world yeah. that we are a part of. Amen. Praise the Lord. Anybody else? Anybody? I'll do more. I Praise the Lord. Even in Sunday school, but I'll tell everybody else. <clears throat> we have a daughter. She's a niece, actually. But, uh, she was diagnosed with breast cancer and yes. had to go through chemo. And they told her in the beginning that she would absolutely have to have her breast removed and that she would have to have radiation. Well, praise the Lord, because her cancer is gone. for prayer this morning, but uh, whenever she went in the hospital, she wasn't able to walk or talk. And then uh, we got a later report, they had her up walking. And the last report we had, uh, they were talking to her and she was talking. And so praise the Lord for that. Her speech is not 100%, but anyway, that was pretty quick and we're thankful for it. Amen. Anybody with a special verse you would like to share or quote or read? Okay, we're going to look at Song of Solomon again, Song of Solomon, chapter 6, Song of Solomon, chapter 6, and uh, some of the things we've been doing in the Discipleship Explosion, we've studied all things about what it means to be a disciple, but the Great Commission said that when you make disciples, you teach them whatsoever things I have commanded you. And so the last two or three weeks, we've been looking at the commands of Jesus. And uh, there's actually three included in one place. And, uh, but anyway, uh, it's at the wedding at Cana of Galilee, which is where Jesus performed his first miracle. Praise the Lord for the miracle we heard about here this morning. Amen. God's still doing miracles today. He did it back then. He turned the water into wine. And then one of those commands was uh, uh, fill the pots with water. Fill the jars with water. And so when we were talking about that, we were trying to discuss, well, how do you apply that to your life nowadays? And... Uh, so we decided that we need to fill ourselves with the Holy Spirit. Yeah. We can't the, the Holy, allow the Holy Spirit Amen. to come into our lives and do that. It's not how much of the Holy Spirit do you have, it's how much of you does he have. Amen. So you fill the jars with water. And then the other uh, thing that we talked about last week was uh, draw some out. <laughs> so you get filled up and then you draw some out. And you share it with others. And that's why we have these testimony times sometimes during our service. You can do that. You've been filled up. Now draw some out. Share it with others. You've got a special scripture. It's blessed you. Share it with others. Mark it in your Bible. Have it ready. Stand up and read it. Memorize it. You don't have to read it. <laughs> and uh, do that. But you can do that. But those are some of the things that we've been talking about. And uh, so I'm excited about that. And uh, we will have this week and maybe next week and then probably the week of Christmas and the week of New Year's, we probably won't uh, add to everybody's busy schedules during that time. But, and then we'll hit the ground running in January and I'm excited about it, what's happening. And we have a small part of that on the Wednesday nights for our Bible studies too. So anyway, 
So that's a part of my testimony I wanted to share. I want to ask you a question. What was your favorite subject when you were in school? Or what is your favorite subject? Some of you might still be in school. But what is your favorite subject? Well, I sympathize and identify with the answer, recess. <laughs> Amen. Or you might know it as break. <laughs> and uh, so I identify with that one very much. That was my favorite subject in school. Now, it seems like that people either are drawn toward math or maybe toward English and reading or something like that. Now, for math, uh, I didn't care for it too much until I got to Algebra 1. Now, this is just strange to a lot of people, but I just love Algebra 1. <laughs> And people say, well, how do you use that in your life? Well, I've used it all of my life. Whenever I uh, ended up uh, being a supervisor in a Christian school, uh, I had to go on from Algebra 1, so I branched out into science and chemistry and biology and physical science. And uh, I hope it was a blessing to Ezra, whenever my kids were here, that they'd uh, come in one day a week and I'd answer science questions and be able to do that. So, so that was kind of where I went. But then I ended up being weak in history. Some people really like history. That's their thing, social studies. And so now that I'm in the ministry, I wish I knew more about history. So I'm still relearning history as it applies. But one of the other things that was a little bit unusual, maybe, not unusual, but I liked reading. I really liked reading when I was in the first and second grade. And the reason why was because I wanted to read what it said in those little balloons there in the comic books. That's why I liked reading. That's why I learned how to do it. Some people put down comic books a little bit, but my mom was a school teacher. And she said, well, anything that encourages you to read, I'm for so uh, I liked reading. And then we had the subject was called English. And, uh, well, it as a subject is kind of, I don't know, it just wasn't way up there in excitement. But I discovered something that uh, in those first few years there, they came to a section, they called it parts of speech. And so we learned about nouns, verbs, and adverbs, and adjectives, and uh, preposition. Preposition is a big word, a little word with a big meaning that shows a relationship. So it could be anything that a, a dog does to a doghouse. He could be in the doghouse, on the doghouse. If he runs hard enough, he can run through the doghouse. He can be under the doghouse. He can do that. Well, anyway, so I, I discovered those things there, and uh, we just had to memorize them, so I wasn't too uh, hyped up over it. But then next year, we come to English again. You start through the lessons in English, and it says, parts of speech. And I'm thinking, didn't we learn about that last year? So... I said, yes, we did. So here they are again, nouns, verbs, adjectives, so forth, the parts of speech. And I'm thinking, okay, well, I kind of know that, but I'm really going to pay attention to it this year, so I really got them fixed in my mind. The next year, we come up, you go in English, two or three weeks, parts of speech. I said, wow, I know that. Boy, I liked it. I felt good I'm doing English. So I got to where I kind of liked English, even though I was doing the same thing every year. I had to get a little more elaborate on some of those parts of speech whenever they did that. And uh, I had to uh, take a test to uh, go to Southwestern Baptist Seminary. And uh, to be able to go there, I got a letter of commendation because of a high score on the English portion of the entrance exam. <laughs> but... In English and grammar, some of the things that you learn about is similes and metaphors. 
And that sounds like that would be really hard, but I just figured out that it was a comparison. It's where you compare one thing to another thing, and how do you tell the difference? And I don't know, for some people this seems to be really difficult to them, but for me, I just found a little trick. If it has the word like, or the word as, then it's a simile. If it doesn't have like or as, then it's a metaphor. That was just so easy. I was just so excited about that. So it'd be like this. We'd say, Jesus is like a lamb. Or if you say, Jesus is a lamb, then that's a metaphor. If you say, he's like a lamb, it's a simile. I'm just as happy as I can be. Well, that's, that would be a simile. It's got as in it. I'm happy. It's a metaphor. Kind of. <laughs> it's not the best example. So, you have comparisons. Similes and metaphors. And here in the Song of Solomon, you, you have the story, it's a love story between King Solomon and he goes out and he sees this uh, young girl that works out in a vineyard that the royal family owns and he takes notice in her and then anyway they get together and it's the love story of that and it ends up in the marriage and so we're, pat we're into the marriage part now and it's describing their love for each other. And last week we talked about how that uh, she really built up the bridegroom and she did all these descriptions of him to her friends. Because they said, well, what's so special? Why you want us to try to find him for you? And she told them what was special about him. And that's the way it ought to be for all of us that are married. We, you know, that our, our spouse ought to be really special to us. And I know I heard one time... Uh, uh, the preacher's preaching on marriage, and he said, well, you ought to tell each other that you love each other. And, and uh, one man in the congregation jumped up and said, oh, preacher, my wife knows that I love her. I don't have to tell her all the time. And then she stood up and said, well, it would be nice to hear it once in a while. <laughs> and so we should do that. So you... So you're having the description of that. Well, here in the sixth chapter, uh, the friends of the woman speak a little bit, and then the woman speaks again, and then the man speaks, and it goes on in to the seventh chapter, and now it's his turn, and he starts describing what he likes about her. But I want to call our attention just to uh, two verses here in particular. Verse 4. The first one, he is beginning to speak, and he's speaking to his wife, and he says, You are beautiful as Tirzah, my love, comely as Jerusalem, awesome as an army with banners. And then come down to verse 10. He says, Who is this who looks forth like the dawn, fair as the moon, radiant as the sun, awesome as an army with banners. So we have some metaphors here. So he's talking about his wife and he's describing her and uh, he compares her first of all to beautiful cities. Now I don't know how excited uh, it would be for me to go tell Rhonda that she's as beautiful as Thompsonville, but uh, or McLeansboro, either one. Uh, I don't know how that is, but he's describing her as being as beautiful as a city, the city of Tirzah and the city of Jerusalem. And both of these were the royal cities. There was a time whenever it was all one kingdom together, you know, under David and Solomon, you had the United Kingdom. And then under Solomon's son, Rehoboam, it split apart. When you split it apart, then you had two different royal cities. So Tirzah is the north, northern one. And that was called Israel. They called it Israel there. And in the southern kingdom, they called it Judah. And Jerusalem was in the southern kingdom. Well, you just think about 
all these beautiful things that are associated with the cities and the houses. I, have, I get exposed to the beautiful things that are in houses because Rhonda loves HGTV. And uh, so you have beautiful houses and beautiful gardens and things like that. And so Solomon is coming back and he's pre pre uh, comparing his wife to these beautiful cities, these beautiful places, these beautiful dwellings, these beautiful houses. And the Bible compares our body to the tabernacle. It says it is our tabernacle. I know one time that there was a man that was talking about and he was talking to the preacher and said, oh, I don't hurt anybody. I, I, you know, I smoke and if you smoke, you just take it however you want to on this. But he said, I don't hurt anybody in doing that. And then the preacher got up and he said, you know, here it is in this time of year that we have these orchards that are around here that have peach trees and apple trees and different things. And they are concerned about it freezing. So what they do is they take these little pots and they light them and it heats up and the smoke comes out. They call smudge pots. He said, now... We know that this building here is just a building that we meet in, but we refer to it as the house of God, right? Everybody shaking their head, yes. yes. He said, well, none of you would dream of coming in here with a smudge pot and taking it around near all the walls. Would you do that? And then he said, and your body is the temple of God. So I'm just saying take it for whatever it's worth. <laughs> uh, but... He was comparing that her, to a temple, to a house. Just think about it, the beautiful cities. The New Testament says that we, the church, we are the bride of Christ. He wants us to be able to be presented unto him as a church, blameless, spotless before God. And so we should be holy. We should be set apart. So that whenever we come before the Lord, we can appear as spotless. And uh, thinking about being set apart, and you want to live for the Lord. I know that one testimony I heard uh, a little while back was somebody said, well, uh, we were going to meet with our friends, and yet our friends kind of didn't want to meet with us. And said, well, we figured out why. And in fact, they even said it. I don't know, they might have said it in derision. They said something like, well, you're just too good for us. And then they said, well, you know, there was a time that would, that would really have hurt me, but I kind, of, I kind of took it as just a little compliment. This time, well, that's what it ought to be. We ought to be set apart for the Lord, not, not braggingly and not looking down our nose at anyone else but by wanting to live for God and live in the way that God would have us to live, it makes a difference as people look at us. If we have that. And then, uh, so, it, it's good sometimes that we work on our appearance. I tried to lose a little weight here, and maybe some of you can tell a little difference. And I've tried to do that. I've been working on my appearance. But you know what's more important is what's in here. We should do that. We should work on our appearance. There is that inner beauty, and then there is the character that's within our hearts. Somebody says, what is character? It's what you do when no one's looking. Because somebody's always looking. I mean, God knows, and Christ knows, but since he's invisible to us, it's Kind of like we think, uh oh, nobody's around, nobody's looking. The character is what you do when nobody's looking. Well, you had this comparison to these beautiful cities and dwellings and our own dwelling. And it ought to be the dwelling where the Holy Spirit is welcome. And it comes into our hearts and He fills us. And how much of the Holy Spirit do we have? When we talked about fill the jars with water, 
Uh, I was reminded of what uh, Brother Savage, some of you know Brother Savage, an evangelist, and uh, he preached here at Ezra several times. One time he said, whenever Sister Cup gets full and overflows, old Brother Saucer gets blessed. Mm -hmm. Well, that's the way it ought to be. <laughs> well, he gets filled up and overflow with the love of God. The second comparison he made here was to the moon and the sun. And these both relate to the light that is shining. Now, in the case of the moon, it is a reflection of the sun. There was a girl one time, and her parents named her Luna. And, uh, well, some of the kids kind of made fun of her name. And she kind of was wondering about that. So she got this name book, and she looked it up. And it said, Moon, Luna, Lunar, Moon. And she said, why did they name me Moon? And then she went to Sunday school, and they talked about the moon was being a reflection of the light of the sun. And we as Christians ought to be a reflection of the light of the sun, the S-O-N, reflection of that. And so he's talking about her. She reminded him of the moon in the night. And even in the daytime. You see the moon in the daytime sometimes. Yes. And it talked about the light. And whenever you think about the light, then it talked about the sun. The sun, which was the greater light, the S-U-N. And one of these days, <laughs> uh, over in the book of Revelation, it says that there will not be any need for the S-U-N because the S-O-N will be the light. Well, there's some more metaphors for you, and, and maybe even literal. I don't know. We'll see. We'll find out someday what that is like. But the greater light. In the beginning, God said, let there be light. And then, throughout Christian history and the history of uh, God dealing with people, he set up a tabernacle in the wilderness. And as the priest entered into that first part of the tabernacle, they'd look at the right, and there would be the table of showbread. And then you go years and years later till after Jesus is born, and he says, I am the bread of life. And then you come over to the other side and you have the golden candlestick there. And years later, Jesus goes on the scene and he says, I am the light of the world. So you have light. And so Solomon is looking at her and he's talking about her being like the moon and the sun and the light. And so I'm just using the comparisons here, the analogies. And uh, you have that. It points to Christ. Well, then the nation of Israel, they were told that they were to be a light to the nations. And actually, in their family tree, going on down through the family tree, and we're going to celebrate it here in a few weeks, there's going to be a son. <laughs> For unto you a son is born, unto you a Savior is given, which is Christ the Lord. And so they become a light to the whole world. Yes, by their obedience to God in the Old Testament, by their obedience in their worship in the tabernacle and the sacrifices and all of that, they were a light to the world in that in certain respect too. They're also a light to the world because they bring the Savior into the world. And as I already said, Jesus made the statement to his disciples, I am and the light of the world. And then here's the amazing thing. The next time he talks about that, he says, you are the light of the world. And so I pray that God would let our lights shine, that Jesus would shine forth from us. So we have this Comparison here, the beautiful cities and the light and the moon and the stars. 
Now, <clears throat> this other comparison that he makes is to armies. Now, I think, well, how romantic is that? <laughs> Dear, you're just like an army to me. Just want you to know that. But as you think about the armies, that sometimes as they march, they march together in harmony. They do drills. They do things uh, even in the, uh, in the armies. And now we have the planes, and the planes fly over, and they do all these tricks and do all these things. And you have the majesty of looking at a certain army. And so he's, I, I'm just kind of playing with words here a little bit, but I'm, I'm thinking about it though. He's comparing her to the armies and the banners that they have, the flags that they have. And so sometimes we see the flag. And for, for many of us, that, that stirs a, a lot of good things within our hearts. It helps us to remember that we got these banners here on the wall, hanging on the wall here, reminding us of God. And uh, I was thinking about that as he's talking to her and about the banners. And when we sing a song, and lots of times we let the little kids sing it, but that song is for all of us. And it says, his banner over me is love. And so you have the armies and the banners and the flags and, and all of that. And then an army represents strength. Now, maybe not so much in physical strength, although sometimes uh, the ladies can beat the men in physical strength, but usually in the areas of uh, certain areas, there's, there's more brawn that comes from, from the men. Which the ladies would say, well, then we have the brains, right? <laughs> but I don't know. But he's telling you about the strength. There is a strength. There's a, there's a strength in beauty. In Psalms, the Bible says strength and beauty are in his tabernacle. And we should have both within our lives. And that strength ought to be beautiful uh, within our lives. And so you have that, the strength. And, uh, and as I think about the ladies, they also have a great deal of stamina. They can do many things. Uh, you take some of us men, uh, we will go out and sit in a, underneath a tree waiting for the squirrels to come around or in a tree looking for the deer to walk up or something like that. And sometimes just sit there and enjoy the beautiful and the quiet and peace of nature. And uh, then the wife is at home, and it's kind of like on that commercial of the lady that comes in from the car, and she comes into the house, and the man's supposed to be taking care of the kids, and he's sitting there playing with this little thing that's whirling around, flying through the air, and some of the others are doing it. He's oblivious to what's going on. And the kids are running around and yelling. And she walks in the room and, and she looks over and some of the other kids are doing it. And they're not paying attention to how they're guiding it. And it fall, goes over and knocks the ornament off the tree. And she's just like this. And she goes back out to the car. And she just sits there. You've seen that commercial. Some of you have. Well, but usually she doesn't get to do that. Usually she's the one in there. And here are all the kids running around and screaming. It's amazing to me how that she can multitask. Now somebody says you can't multitask. You can only do one thing at a time. So they say you should be switch tasking. Well, I don't know. It looks like you might be able to multitask because uh, many women can be on the phone talking to their mother or friend and just carrying on a conversation without any lull in the conversation whatsoever, carrying the baby on the hip, and then getting the phone on the speakerphone and pulling out the kitchen drawer and organizing the drawer, taking care of the baby, talking on the phone all at the same time. Now that is strength. That's a thing of strength. You know, I would pray that God would give us strength, though, and stamina where we could stand for him. And then when you think about the armies of God, the Bible tells us that the weapons of our warfare are not carnal, 
They are spiritual. And so we need to have the weapons at our disposal. And the Bible tells us that we also can put on the whole armor of God. So, you know, we can have salvation and we can have faith and we can have righteousness. And these are our weapons. But I was just thinking here about how the bridegroom was talking about his bride. And you can read the other verses. In fact, uh, some of them might get a little graphic for you <laughs> as you're reading them. That's not why I didn't read them. I just really wanted to zero in on these two verses here that you have beauty like the cities and the dwelling and you have uh, the light, the light of the world and you have the strength that can come from God. And there's times that you really, really need strength or sometimes whenever things just fall apart all around you and that you can come to God and he can give you a strength. 